so great that our friends from Borealis uh, Geopower are back in town. Um, no, really, I think it's great. And the work that they've been doing uh, in the backgrounds for their geothermal plants um, are, are remarkable. It's such an opportunity. We're so lucky that we're hot. <laughs> and, yeah. um, so we've got uh, in in order of. Uh, do you guys have a pecking order? I mean, actually, 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 actually I have a head on <laughs> So we've got Ashley Derry, Derry, who is the uh, uh, geophysicist. geophysicist. Excellent. So welcome, um, and Craig Dunn, who's. Chief geologist. Chief geologist. Chief. I just like the word Whoa. chief. I just like the word chief in there. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And Tim Thompson. So we've got the we've got the heart of Borealis Geopower here. And welcome to the town. Thanks for dealing us in. Uh, back when they first initially came with the concept to town, I, remember, I was a reporter back in the day. I think I was working at the TV station. Yeah. And they okay. came to town, and it was really neat. Their message. They gave a no nonsense message about what they could offer and what they couldn't. Lots and I and, couldn't. And uh, straight up, and they've been fair dealing, and 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 we're interested to see where they're at now. So, cool. Let's welcome them. So we have, I think they give us, uh, you know, a little about an hour and a half to two hours to wander through here. What we're just going to start with, and this is some of the, actually the slides that some of you may have seen two years ago. Um, I've taken a few exams in the last two years. I don't remember anything from any of those exams. So we're going to start from scratch. There's probably quite a few new people in the room as well. Um, the goal for this is just to sort of bring the education level up about what geothermal energy is. Um, we constantly, we're one of the very few companies in Canada that are actually in geopower using heat to produce uh, electricity. So this is sort of a, an, an odd one for, I think, the general population to kind of get their head around. We say the word geothermal, people think heat pumps under somebody's garage, that kind of thing. Um, our operation looks a lot more, well, dramatic, I guess, um, and a lot more intense. So we're going to actually wander through what it means to create power from heat. So yeah. first. And I'd like to just interrupt Craig. Oh, absolutely. My interruption is please feel free to interrupt Craig. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a question, say it. It's not meant to be us talking like a monologue for two hours. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know if you want to hear me for an hour and a half straight up. So, um, Fairly simple, the word geothermal just means earth heat. Um, what we're actually really, really shocked by is how many people don't recognize how hot our planet is or what an incredible source of heat it is. So once we get past this crust, you know, when we think of it, when we tell the kids, it's you know, kind of the skin of the apple. We've never drilled through this. We've never even come close to acquiring anywhere near the heat resource we have on our planet. Due to some very bright geophysicists, um, you know, we're looking at temperatures on our planet, 5,500 degrees. You know, rough estimates closer to five. Other guys are saying 62. At this point, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> The center of our planet is a ridiculously hot resource, and it's continuing to generate heat, which is another aspect that people don't seem to get around. It's actually thermal decay. So you know, thorium, potassium, as they break down, they release energy. So we have an incredible heat resource. I get the question a lot, you know, how much resource heat do you have? If anyone engineers in the audience, you know, we're millions in, in the crust alone of, of actual joules of heat, of energy available for whatever we choose to use them for, heating or cooling or power. The problem is, can we cost effectively get it out of the ground? And that's what we're going to talk today about. The other aspect of this is that when we talk about a renewable resource, this planet will continue to generate heat estimates between five and six billion years. So there's, the joke is that our sun will run out before I run out of heat. So if someone asks you if it's renewable, we can get into that debate, usually over a beer. <laughs> Hottest known geothermal regions. Does anyone see something pretty funny about this map? Mm. Ashley doesn't count. <laughs> Let's try, hand down. We get this joke all the time. We're the only country, Canada, the only country in the Pacific Rim that has yet to develop its geothermal resource. Any idea why? Oil's fun. Oil's fun. That's a sort of good answer. Cheap. Uh, cheap. Hydro's cheap. Hydro's cheap. That's it. So what we've actually seen is that People like Dr. Catherine Hickson, who have worked for the GSC for 30 years studying volcanoes, active volcanoes here in BC. We laugh about this because they, the plate basically merges here. That's what happens geologically. Those plate boundaries merge solid over the Canadian border, 
and then they open back up in Alaska. No, that's totally not true, people. <laughs> the plate boundary is one of the key spots for developing a geothermal resource. We see this throughout the globe, places like Japan, New Zealand, uh, all through the Philippines, Indonesia. These are all places that have already developed their geothermal resource, dramatically in some cases, thousands of megawatts online. We have, as you said, cheap hydro. There's a bunch of other reasons as well. But it doesn't mean we don't have the resource here in Canada. It just means we haven't developed it for power. So what we see in the community is they look and say, hey, where are the power plants? That must be where the geothermal resource is. And the international map has a tendency to miss it. This has been corrected since, but this was on there forever. Now, this is probably one of the most important slides we have in terms of educating audiences so that they can go on to educate others. We hear the word geothermal, and most people think of this. This is the heat pump side, using a heat resource in the ground. And we actually spend electricity to move the heat around. It's a cost-effective solution. It requires that you put some infrastructure money in, the capital outlay, and then you have a long-term stable heat resource. Um, we see this in like you know houses, condos. There's a lot more um, utility-based settings where they're trying to do these on a community level. Then you see some real cost effectiveness. The next sort of sliding down that spectrum is the direct heat use. So you actually drill deeper into a resource that may not be 20 or 30 degrees, but maybe 50 or 60 degrees C. You can use that for greenhouses, direct community heating. Um, there's a number of projects that look like this. The best one that we can think of for direct heat is um, for Klamath Falls out in Oregon, if you guys wanted to look that one up. We're starting to slide into this category here. So this is what Borealis is focused on, is sort of the lower end of the power generation, but you're actually creating electricity. So it's almost the opposite of a heat pump program. A heat pump, you're actually using electricity to move heat. We're actually moving heat to produce electricity. And we'll get into how you do that. If I had a lot of people go, wow, that sounds really neat. That must be <coughs> totally new. We've been doing it since 1908. Technically 1904, but they had a little bit of issues back online 1908. They lost about a year during one of the wars, and they've been doing it ever since. So this is not a new concept. We've been using heat for all sorts of direct use applications from, for thousands of years, for that matter. But we've actually put power online with a geothermal resource for decades. So when we hear that it's new, the t some of the technology is new, some of the binary cycle continues to advance and improve the efficiency. Um, and that's what we're actually looking at here in, in the Canoe Reach area for our Canoe Reach project in Belmont. What we actually see developed first, though, was the dry steam. So places where, you know, guys are right out of the ground. People look at that and go, oh my god, that's heat to surface. I have boiling water coming out of the ground. I can turn that into power. So this is the reason that places like Indonesia, uh, the Philippines, New Zealand, Iceland. Iceland's probably one of the cheapest power supplies in the world, thanks to geothermal. So that's what they were developing. So that's the first. What does this thing look like? <clears throat> what we actually are trying to do is to move hot water and steam out of the ground to a power facility, create that the power of the heated water goes through the turbine and produces electricity. Pretty straightforward. The easiest way that I think to figure it out is that imagine your kettle, turn your kettle on, crank up the heat, as your kettle starts to produce steam, put your flywheel over top. That is the, and Tim's an engineer, he's probably crying to himself a little bit at how simple this is, but that's the general principle, is I'm turning heat into mechanical energy. That's putting the, the electrons online. That water is then re-injected, so at a cooler temperature, back into the formation, at which point it's reheated. Now, this part of the equation, from injection back to production, requires us to have a very, very good understanding of the geologic environment. So what do the rocks look like down home? If this is one solid block with no fracture and no sort of pathway, then we can't deliver because we can't get that cold water back to pick up the heat and move it back over. The most important part about this, it's not the water that is the resource. The water is like a backpack taking your, your books to school. We can use it over and over and over and over again. And for us, we actually want to use that water over and over again because that is what's allowing us to pull the heat out of that system. If designed correctly, this should run indefinitely. I should never take more heat out of that system than is being brought in. Now, one, sometimes we see 
systems where you might put the injection too close. And then I'm pulling heat out faster than it can recover. In other cases, we may put it too far away where we see no indication that it's affecting it at all. And that comes down to some really good reservoir modeling. We'll talk about that in a bit. Any questions? Could someone basically explain what was going on if I showed you this slide? <laughs> this is about as simple as it gets, but in reality, this is a dry steam facility, or a wet steam facility, obviously, um, and this isn't emissions, that's actually just steam coming out of the ground with a little bit of CO2 in it. So our situation is that we actually, and you'll see that next slides, um, we'll actually have an emission-free facility in a location like, like we all want. Oh, what do they look like? The word geothermal actually just means earth heat. There's actually a number of different kinds of earth heat um, in different environments is a better way of describing it. The one that we're looking at that is probably the most dominant development resource for geothermal is fractured systems. So a hydrothermal, so meaning it's water and heat. And the idea is that I can bring that heat to surface with a copious amount of steam and hot water, cool it off, put it back into that formation, travels through that fractured pathway, <coughs> up the production well, and back into that system. So you should just imagine this thing going around and around and around. The advantage, <coughs> one of the key advantages to the hydrothermal system is I need flow, I need a medium, so the flow is just the movement, so a fracture system below. I need a medium, which in this case is the water, and I need the heat. A hydrothermal system has all three. Everyone following? Good. All right. This is, what, this is one example where you see the fractured system. That water is moving into that fractured system from you know, mountain, patai, mountain peaks, um, other fractured environments. You guys have a beautifully fractured system. I know I cut myself about 14 times today doing field work. Um, but that environment where you have a large, deep basin, mountains on either side, what we actually see on the subsurface is those fractures continue throughout. So we didn't pick Belmont just because it was such a beautiful town. Um, we picked Belmont because that geologic environment is amazing for a geothermal resource. So how do we actually locate and what does a geothermal reservoir look like? What we, what we do is we use a number of oil and gas techniques, a number of mining techniques, things like um, geophysics. So we're using different tests. Um, we were out actually this morning doing what's called biogeo, um, <laughs> the worst word, biogeochemical analysis. <laughs> yeah, it sounds smart. Actually, we would just basically scrape tree bark off trees. Um, <laughs> but the rest of the process is quite complicated, right? Right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, the analysis comes from you know soil sampling, the biogeochemistry analysis. We're going to do a lot of like rock analysis, right? You know, we have three boulders in the back of our car right now that we chunked off the side of the mountain. We'll do those for fresh uh, fracture testing. This is part of the sort of geologic testing environment. What we're actually looking for is to make sure that we can locate the best place to hit hot water with the least amount of drilling. So the farther I have to drill, the more expensive it gets, the more my CEO starts to go, really? Can we not do it a little too? A little faster? So the goal for us is to hit the resource at the prime spot where we're moving the most amount of heat with the least amount of drilling cost. This is the worst, one of the worst environments for investment because we have a high capital cost right out of the gate. So the wind and the solar guys can put up, I think it's called an anemometer, is one of the ones that just spins for a year. You can say, hey, this is my wind resource. And then you can do the math on what it'll cost to develop. We do it the other way around. We have you spend a bunch of money, then find out how good your resource is. And that, that whole dynamic is another reason that the geothermal industry has struggled, is because we may make a big investment to get a resource. Now, at the end of the day, we might have one of the lowest levelized costs of power. So over our 20 years, people look back and go, wow, geothermal was the cheapest. Why didn't we develop more geothermal? The reason is because people get nervous about that initial risk. Now, in oil and gas, we take that risk but we can get paid back in a matter of months in some cases. I say we in oil and gas because I'm from Calgary and if I don't use that terminology, no one invites me for lunch. <laughs> the initial capital investment though is so high, but it has what we call like a utility grade payback. So we see a power price that is nice, and stable, long term. It's a 20 or 30 year contract. If you told somebody what, that I'm gonna drill an oil and gas well for nat or a natural gas well, and I'm gonna have a 20 year payback, Tim, how do you think that they'd handle that? 
pass. I thought he said ass, but <laughs> <laughs> which would be probably more accurate. Um, so the big things that drive this utility grade, what we're actually trying to do is put power online. And another aspect of this is that we're not drilling for a commodity like gold or oil. We're actually drilling for to sell power to the utility. So that comes back to, you know, we're actually selling electrons. So we have to take that heat, put it into a turbine, so that we can get the power onto the grid system. And that is actually, as a geologist, that was weird for me. Because now I'm starting to worry, like they do with the pipelines, where is my resource and how do I get it to market? And what's that price in the market? So if I'm fighting with a hydro guy who's paying, you know, three cents a kilowatt hour, I look at that and no matter where I put that project, I'm not going to be cost effective. If I'm paying 10 or 11 cents for power and the price has gone up, then there's a whole lot of geologic options that now work. So that's, that was a bit of a hard one for me as I remember putting a few maps up and be like, oh my god, this resource is amazing. And the engineer down the hall will go, Craig, it's a thousand miles from anything. You're fired. <laughs> okay, well, don't, just let me be mad. Um, the turbine itself is, uh, we have actually have power online in North America, a um, beautiful spot out in Alaska, where they've developed a resource that's only cranking out at 74 degrees Celsius. So we're actually producing power uh, without actually having any steam. So what we're going to talk about is the binary turbine. The more flow that I can get into these environments, the hotter the temperature, it's a direct relationship to how much power I develop. Not quite direct, but the idea is that if I can get more temperature, I'm moving more joules of energy. The more I can flow it, the more joules of energy I'm, I'm moving. So we, the other side of this is that in order for my turbine to be most efficient, I actually need to cool off some of my outgoing water. And it seems counterintuitive. But the goal for us is that if we have, for instance, a cold stream running by our facility or an incredibly cold environment, i.e. Canada, um, then we actually improve the efficiency of the system. So the same plant in Arizona that's air-cooled will actually be less efficient than one here in Vail. I'll let Tim sort that one out. <laughs> same idea. So instead of moving hot water that powers my flywheel, I move hot water past another product. In this case, we call it a, a binary fluid. So this actually goes across a heat exchange, and this is the binary versus the standard flash or, or dry steam environment. That hot water heats up a secondary fluid, which actually turns to gas at a lower temperature. This is how we're able to produce power from a uh, resource that may only be 74 degrees Celsius. There's a couple key advantages to this, is that this hot water is constantly behind a pipe. So it's a completely closed system. The only way that this water is interacting with anything but a pipe is with my resource below. So if this water isn't perfectly clean, if it's not drinkable, it's not potable, it's not being used for anything but moving heat. So this transfer mechanism allows us to have a very, very tight, almost invisible system. The best example I can think of this is I actually went to Reno, which is such a beautiful town. Um, no one's been to Reno, obviously. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Uh, I go and I want to see the steamboat plant. I want to say, hey, this is one of the coolest facilities. We've been running for 20 years. I can see it on the hill. So I drive up to the uh, local store and I say, hey, how do I get into that facility? There's only like one road and I keep missing it off the interstate. She goes, what facility? I'm like, the, the power plant on the top of the hill. Oh, I always wondered what that was. How long have you lived here? My whole life. <laughs> it has no anything. It's got a couple of fans on the top, and it's far enough away that nobody could even hear the fans. So within two or three hundred meters from the entry road, there's no sign. There's no anything. It just sits beautifully at the top of the hill. It produces half of Reno's power. And this lady across the street didn't even know it was there. This is actually one of the issues we have with marketing, is that on a wind turbine, you can put up a wind picture. People go, oh, wind. You know, solar, same deal. What do we put up? A wellhead? <laughs> so it's sort of a double-edged sword, but this binary system actually gives us a really good opportunity to keep almost all of our infrastructure small and our land use very, very small because almost all of our infrastructure is spent drilling holes in the ground. Um, are, there, are there any... So in the explore, exploration mode, when you're drilling, as people do all over for all sorts of different reasons, yep. are there, is there any, is it ever hazardous or anything when you drill that deep, drill test holes? 
Is yeah. there any considerations? Yes, lots. Um, and I always joke that the ugliest part about geothermal are the drillers. <laughs> I mean drilling. Uh, the, uh, there are a number of things that we worry about, you know, we're dealing with in some cases if it's 150 degrees, if that water comes to surface, there's safety issues. Um, drilling into unknown rock is always going to have a number of safety environments. I've worked on a, a drill rig for probably seven or eight years of my life, um, and just drilling alone is, is, it can be dangerous work. Um, there's a number of sort of safety things that we do with temperatures that are above sort of 80 or 90 degrees C. Um, in terms of how you cool mud, how you deal with what fluids you do. Um, there's also a pretty safe protocol in the, in the Canadian market. We actually have some of the most safety, most safety rules associated with drilling here in, in uh, Alberta and BC. Um, having been overseas and drilled, <laughs> we're good here in Canada. And it's not to say that they don't make mistakes. It's not to say that the drilling process is not probably the ugliest part of this whole program. Um, but at the end of the day, we may only be on site for th two or three months at a time. And then once the facility is shut down, and this is one of the reasons coming from an oil and gas background that I got into geothermal, is because I would be on a project, we would drill the holes, and I would have to come back the next year to drill more holes because that resource was finite. Um, when, we said, when we talk about geothermal, that is probably the most exciting thing for me as a geologist is I'm going to get to drill the holes, and if I put these in the right locations, I may never have to drill holes again which is, a, is kind of a crazy concept, is that I have a resource that just runs. Now the infrastructure involved with between piping and drilling and everything else, to put those first drills in place is the reason that geothermal struggles, is because you need that front end environment. So to get back to the drilling, um, there are a number of safety protocols in place, and some of them are quite litigious, is that the right word? That means we're getting sued. <laughs> <laughs> so let's hope not. <laughs> They're detailed. Detailed, thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, how far apart are the input and output holes usually? Very good question. Uh, I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> now, the reason I'm not telling you is because every environment is different. So if I'm in a what's called a, a very tight um, geologic environment, I have to put those input and output wells quite close because I may not have the fracture system to move them further. Ideally, I want a really well fractured zone and then I'd spread them further apart. The disadvantage to that is now I have to move water from production well out to injection well. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, um, and that is completely based on our, our subsurface analysis and the reservoir modeling. Are you talking on the surface or at depth? Because we might put them adjacent, 10 meter offset at the surface, but we might bend them out at depth. Yeah, that's the other question. Oh, so you're talking surface? Cool. Yeah, surface. Well, surface probably any, enough to give us a reasonable work over space. I've been on drilling programs where they slid the rig over 10 meters okay. <laughs> and then they would drill it out again. It's usually anywhere between 20 and 30 to, for wellhead separation um, and then for us as Tim was talking about you can actually directionally drill which is technology that's significantly improved in the last two decades. Good. Uh, do, are you uh, experiencing any effects of earthquake? in the fracture zone? Yeah, micro seismicity. This is a very good question as well. Um, there's nothing to say that we wouldn't have some of that. Um, one of the things that is really important is to have a, a very solid baseline to know exactly what your seismic environment is. Um, and that's part of the sort of the exploration. So you create, this is the standard. Um, there have been incidents in the world of, of areas where the drilling crew and the program to help improve the fracture system has created some level of micro seismicity. Um, we're talking like your cup shapes. And the one example that is quite common uh, to reference is the one in Switzerland where they were actually drilling in town. Mm -hmm. So you could walk to the grocery store past the drill rig. Um, and that was one that sort of really got people thinking about that environment. Uh, is it long term? Uh, depends on how you design the program. We actually in our situation here in Belmont don't think that we need to do a fractured environment. Uh, so the, rank, the odds of having induced seismicity are quite, you know, quite, quite small. So kind of just add that I don't know if that came across the right way. In some some cases you don't necessarily get the permeability subsurface that you want. So then you do it's not fracking in the BC sense of you know rubbleizing a shale field, mm -hmm. but you might actually do a different version of fracture creation, which is induced, which will then by induce, pressure. Yeah, by pressure, which will then possibly give you induced seismicity. If, however, you have a sufficiently fractured system already, which is what, then you don't have to do that. 
And then the odds that you're going to increase the seismicity drop rate on. So One so added question. If there is natural earthquake activity yes. or movement, do you take that into account? Or are you measuring that or are you yes. affected by that? We are we measure all, all and to some degree here. The yeah, I'm not going to <laughs> My view is I'm not geology. It's just great the geology question. I'm going to give it to you now. <laughs> is that we are affected by it, but only in a catastrophic sense. Oh, okay. So if there's a time of earthquakes, they won't affect our well completions. But if everything moved left one foot, oh, yeah, a thousand be people on the ground, it yeah. might flip us off. But that, that's such a it's rare It's very, event. very rare. But we have bigger issues on the surface, if you will. Okay. Right? There's another aspect of that. One of the things that we look for in a fractured environment to create that downhole permeability is uh, what well, is a certain level of micro seismicity. So we actually want to see that the the system is still moving, and we can actually we can actually do some really interesting topography analysis early on to say your formation is moving but barely, and then we can look at it after and say, hey, did it change? Did it get less or more? But by actually locating where it's moving is a really, really good indication for us of a great resource. So we, we're we very happy to study that stuff. Um, electrons for sale. So this is, I'm doing it back to Tim. I'm going to talk about the engineering <coughs> as a geologist. So it works out just fine. Um, as I say, this was a hard one to get your head around. I'm not sure if everyone, does everyone know how you make electricity from a power facility? Spin a turbine? Spin a turbine, yeah. The, the easiest one that we did as kids is you take two magnets and you run them past each other and you create an electrical charge. It, it's significantly more complicated than that at a grander scale, but the general principle still stands. And that's actually how we make power from almost you know, natural gas, coal, nuclear. We basically just boil water, power a turbine by running the turbine across a magnetic system. Decent? Yep. Yeah. Um, I've been throwing words around like kilowatts, cents per kilowatt, megawatts. The easiest way for me to originally get into this was one megawatt, thousand homes. So that's about what you use. It's a little bit less, there's a little bit fewer homes in Canada because we're kind of power hogs. Um, the number almost doubles in places like Mexico. Um, but in the Canadian market, if you can try to remember one megawatt, a 10 megawatt plant, 10,000 homes. Um, the dip price point, <coughs> For most jurisdictions, we pay about nine, eight, nine cents in Calgary. Um, the cheapest power that we've seen in sort of the last two decades is like three, four cents. BC Hydro, for many, many years, was in that sort of three to five cent category. Um, the hardest part about the geothermal is rather than a barrel, which I can put on a, you know, put in a pipeline and ship where I need it. Um, or gold for that matter, you dig it up and you wait till the price is where you want it to be before you, you sell it or choose not to develop it until you can sell it at that price. We can't store electricity. Um, people go, oh, I've got a battery at home. We can't. Difficult to store electricity cost effectively <laughs> is what it should say there. Uh, so as soon as we have to put electricity into some sort of storage facility or storage device, if you want to think of it that way, uh, we quickly lose all of our cost effectiveness to it. So that number you know, doubles, triples kind of thing. Uh, so for us, one of the big issues is that we want to deliver power where it's needed. So at the end of a line is a good example. Communities that may be struggling with power security is another great example. Or areas where the utility has said, we need power here. We either have to upgrade a line to get power out there, or we can deliver power right into that environment because they need it on a regular basis. The biggest advantage, I think, for geothermal is that we don't just run when the sun shines, when the wind blows, when the plant's online. The plant's always online. So once we start moving that water through that system, it's not like the earth has cooling and you know, warming cycles. It's always hot and we're always moving water. So we have what's called base load capacity. Has everyone heard that term before? Okay, it's just suggesting that intermittent power, usually they cut it off at about 60%. That means on a good day. It just means that they can't rely on that power system. It means that it comes on and comes off. You know, they usually think of coal or nuclear as a base load power supply because it's operating at greater, greater than 80% of the time. Right? Education and electricity. So we, you, joke, we joke it's like... Do you work with BC Hydro or do you compete or cooperate or do you use their net? Uh, uh, compete with BC Hydro. Is that what BC Hydro. Uh, <laughs> what a question. Um, BC Hydro has chosen to not pursue electricity generation outside of building dams. I think that's been 
their mandate for maybe the last decade. Um, so in that sense, they've invited in the market and they've opened up about, uh, now it's almost a little greater than six, but a little less than a third of the market is supplied by independent suppliers of various provenances. There's good ones, there's bad ones, and those guys in the middle. Uh, so we would be part of that, what's called independent power producer group that work with BC Hydro. They, they control the markets. They would buy our all power for the citizens of BC. Um, that's a difficult relationship sometimes, I'll be honest. Because their issue is, of course, too, they need a steady supply, and you add, and they cannot store surplus, or they cannot count on your reduced contribution. That's, that's not entirely true, because BC Hydro uniquely has the largest storage system in the world. So any time you displace water that could have run behind the dam, it sits behind the dam. So in their case, I think you guys might be aware of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it goes up and down, and they they do play. Their issue is that they have actually seasonal supplies of water, so they are trying to serve a baseload market with really what truly is an intermittent supply option with a certain amount of shock absorption in the system through the dam, and they're coming up against it, frankly. So they, that's where I think they first, it wasn't too long ago they built that thermal system at Ferrari. Mm -hmm. It's now been online full, full blast and built and they probably need one or two more base load systems. Thermal. So they what thermal is? They also play a power arbitrage. Uh, they sell clean power to the states and buy dirty power from Alberta on a base load. They, Shh. Don't tell anybody. They make a lot of money. Yeah. It's very good for the province, but it's the, sh the short answer to this is the BC does offer a standard offer program, uh, the SOP for anything under 15 megawatts. Our goal is uh, a 10 megawatt facility, so we would fall under that current program. So we would actually sell the power to BC Hydro. Is yes. one example? This is uh, this is another one that's that's big. Is that we actually need the transmission in place. The longer you have to build a power line to your location, this was the joke I made earlier. It's a thousand miles from nowhere. Uh, that immediately can take your project from being a beautiful geothermal resource to no chance that it's developing because you don't have the power system. You guys have a really, I was quite happy the first time we drove out here to look at the property prior to bidding and I drove down the east side of the lake and I'm like, there's still a power line, there's still a power line. So it actually extends quite far down if any of you guys are, most people don't look at power lines, I never used to until I got this job, but it actually extends right to the old mill site. How many people knew that? Oh, about half. All right, that's pretty good. So Probably because he thought it was an eyesore, right? <laughs> and will it take uh, 10, 10 megawatts? Probably not. Um, that's a good one for Tim, though. It could. It, it, you, it's not a great engineering challenge to upgrade a residential supply system to take 10 megawatts. It's actually not that hard. We don't get into transmission grade stuff. What about the BC Hydro's line from here to Camelot's? Oh, good question. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> no, I don't think you can do that. That's a respectful it? answer. Uh, we, I, we actually don't want to, it would be much more expensive to attach to a high grade line because we need an incredibly expensive substation. It might cost anywhere low end five land, 25 million bucks. Whereas we might be able to attach to a residential line with a $100,000. So for us, we're actually looking for a lower power line to connect. Um, so there is, you know, it would basically look like what would normally be the backbone line in the community. So it wouldn't be your standard 10 wire, just a little bit bigger. You'd be able to take no problem. Would you then convert it to DC prior to transportation or keep it in its current form? Uh, well, our generation system is typically custom built. So we would typically get from the buyer of power, all the specs they wanted for delivery, and we just hand that over to the person who built the generator. So we, we, we built the suit, if you will. We just want to make sure that they've told us absolutely everything about the business that they want. Once we built it, it's very hard to muck about it after the fact. There, there's one other aspect of this, too, that we haven't really talked about, is that the comment I made about you know power infrastructure building out to the line. If you're in a, at the end of a line situation and your community is trying to grow or is growing, then they may have to upgrade that line for the extent of the entire line. So the last port of power point has to be you know, improved to get better quality power at the very end of the line. 
I'm a huge advocate that if we just start putting power at the end of the line, then you don't need to do those major infrastructure designs because you're actually putting power where it's needed. So in some cases, you can actually change the direction of power flow. It's sort of an idealistic viewpoint on it. But. Does this help them uh, on Robson Valley become an island in times of, we have been cut off on a major power supply, or is that just, it seems kind of like an odd situation we've got 10 megawatts online this is and Tim the transmission goes down. This is Tim's point exactly, that if, if BC Hydro said, you know what, you can actually just design your plant to feed back at the <coughs> very end of the distribution plant, trying not to get into that major power environment, then if they cut the line, it wouldn't matter. Great. Let's do it. You can just sort of laugh when one light's on in all of Northeast BC. <laughs> <laughs> hey, is that fun? Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, we're doing okay for time. How's everyone doing? Everyone following? Or? Okay. I have to say I, uh, I've struggled with what they now call the curse of knowledge, which I've been doing this for almost a decade now. So if I skip too far too fast, it's only because I think everyone should know this already. <laughs> um, this is actually was part of my learning curve as well, is that I understood a lot of the geologic exploration type modeling, but these programs are intense uh, in terms of the number of stops you have to make. Because in many cases, like a gold facility, you may get the gold out of the ground and then you have a market to sell immediately. Um, for us, we actually have to do the identification of the resource, do our subsurface exploration, start to raise finance, then move on to more extensive drilling program. While you're doing this, you're also working on your power purchase agreement, your utility integration, talking about what our plant looks like, when does this come online. Then you start to move into the actual construction of a power plant. In some cases, that would be two, three years. So this whole program, you know, add a year or two, add a few more. This is not a six month, eight month kind of operation. Most geothermal facilities, if they had glitch free runtime from exploration right to power online, would be a minimum of four years. And we have seen very, very few projects that are managing to get to that level that quickly. In many cases, these are seven to 10 year programs. So where are you right now? We were not glitch free. We would definitely be in the phase one, the site identification, the early exploration. Um, we haven't even started our drilling program um, where you would have known about it. We've had a couple of these already. Um, so for us, we're very much in that phase one of the design. Now, one of the advantages is, is if, you're, if you're able to do some of this um, in parallel, if we can actually start to talk to the power, how about the power purchase agreement prior, if you're starting to already have some of the finance in place for this aspect of it, then these projects do move closer to that four-year timeline. Everyone good? Okay. I, I just throw this slide up because we talked about it a little bit earlier, but this is, this is important because we get this a lot, especially in Canada, oh, there's no megawatts, must have no resource. Oh, this geothermal thing seems really new. I get that one a lot. Yeah, really new. It's like six, four and a half billion years old. Um, we actually have been doing power projects globally for quite a long time now. We're getting quite good at some of the geologic analysis, some of the reservoir modeling, some of the plant design. We're improving every year globally. We see a ton of companies um, that have chosen not to participate in the North American market to go to places like Chile, and Indonesia, and Philippines, and New Zealand. We have actually some of the best trained geoscientists in the world here in Canada. We do resource development all over the place. And in many cases, we export geologists to the rest of the world. We are, not, we are now doing this with geothermal. We have a lot of qualified geoscientists that are working in geothermal projects, not here in Canada. And in many cases, they may be working for a geothermal uh, Canadian company. So 3,100 megawatts worldwide, we're at, I think, 0.2% or 0.4% of the global power output. Um, so we have a lot of room to grow. Uh, this number is actually even higher. Uh, every, every time I make this slide, they outdate it. Um, there's actually close to 30 countries that are developing power products right now. Some of the biggest in the world, the U.S. is actually one of the first to bring power online in the sort of thousands of megawatt scale. Uh, the geysers in north, northern California produce almost 5% of California's power demand. How many people knew that? Fantastic. Um, but again, places like the Philippines, this is a dry steam field, steam right out of the ground, you know, old faithful kind of stuff. 
Um, but the Philippines has a number of examples. Number three on this chart, I think they've actually been surpassed by Indonesia in the last few months. Um, but Mexico, so that whole geologic environment running up the west coast of our continent, the one that stops at the Canadian border, yeah. Um, the U.S. and Mexico have already driven forward with that. And there are power developments in Alaska as well, lots of opportunity. There's probably another, Kenya is actually one of the fastest growing regions for geothermal development. Um, we've seen a number of companies that have actually moved into the African space because the African government realizes they need a clean base load power supply and they have amazing resource potential. So that's actually one of, um, Africa is actually one of the top areas for geothermal growth in the world right now. Excuse me. Yeah. Why is Canada so far behind? Yeah, good question. We got about five slides for that one. <laughs> Uh, it's not because we're not a good resource. This is uh, one that uh, Tim's put together. We did this for um, analysis about five or six years ago looking at policy, why driving policy in Canada for geothermal development. Um, so availability, as we pointed out, we're online. We come online, we stay close to, the binary system's close to 95% power. So 95% base load capacity. So we turn it on, there's plants in the U.S. that run at 98%. So 98% of the time they're running. Um, that's unheard of in many other, in the power industry. Physical footprint, because a lot of our infrastructure is buried, uh, we don't need mount, you know, full sides for wind turbines, we don't need you know, vast desert fields for solar panels. Um, we put most of our infrastructure in the ground where you can't see it. Air emissions, the binary facility produces none. Uh, in some cases you may see lower, case, you know, some CO2 on some of the flash steam turbines in California and Indonesia that are in the water themselves. But that was sort of a green light, best in class. There are no other wastes in many cases. Uh, it's not like we have tailings off the back of our power facility. Um, the noise, the only noise in some cases is uh, the actual um, air coolers that'll run. It's more like a hum. Um, in many cases, you can't hear them you know, more than a few hundred meters away. The one in uh, Reno is a really good example of that. You know, it's half a kilometer from the road to the actual thing, and you can't hear it from the highway. Um, this one I, I laugh about because if you just paint your wellhead pink and purple, put something on top of it, and that's, you know, in some cases between the power facility and the, the wellhead, that's some of the only things you actually see about the facility itself. And the economics. This one's actually hard for people to get their head around because we talk about over 20 years of your power, you were probably the cheapest, but it took you, all of your capital went in on the front end. So we should have one more on here that would say, you know, comparable by key criteria, how much the banker likes you. And that might be one that we do fit into the red category. <laughs> because it takes so long to develop, it takes so long to bring these things to fruition, and then you have such a slow payback. Now, if you wanted to make your kids rich, invest in geothermal. And that's what we joke about, the 20 year program. That's, that's not crazy, that's what they do the hydro plants at. Mm -hmm. Why are we not developing another, in many cases, cheaper resource than a hydro facility? Uh, it's because you know, they're BC hydro, they're not BC geothermal. So we'll let Tim sort of chat about that one more. You want to answer it now, or are we good? Are there other slides? There's about, there's a few more to talk about the project. Okay. About how to develop a project. I'm going to go through these really. Do you really refer your answer? Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Okay. We're just going to go through what's involved. So, you know, you saw that earlier slide about seven years. We're going to go through the steps that we conventionally go through, and then Tim's going to reference, you know, this part again when we talk about what we need to go through. So, we do our field collection, that's research in the field. Ashley and I are out there today as well. Um, we're back often. You map it, you do uh, geophysical programs. So. You know, the best way to see the rock without drilling, in many cases this is, uh, you know, magnetic surveys, gravity surveys, MT survey, electromagnetics. There's a number of different ways that we can look at the rock without actually drilling it. Um, and then you really need to sort of proof in the pudding. You actually have to put a hole in the ground, and that's probably the next big stage. You take that data set and you start to rebuild your map and your model. So we actually have a lot of uh, subsurface 3D modeling programs involved with a geothermal program. You actually want to see what, it, what you think it looks like, take the data, re-input it, rebuild your model. Uh, and then you go from theory to actual steam behind pipe. And from a financing community, or that's what they want to see. They want to know that you have X amount of joules behind the pipe so when you turn on your power plant, it'll deliver. Five slides, is that what you said? <laughs> Seven years. 
Yeah, so it's a, it's a bit of a battle and there's a lot of, as Tim put it, glitches along the way. We have not been glitch free. That's, that's the standard. Uh, it's not uncommon for geothermal projects to get shelved at many different stages along the way. This is our list at Borealis. Okay, that's one of the biggest ones. We have some amazing resources here in Canada, but they might be at the end of a too far away. Meager Creek is a good example. Um, some of the hottest rocks in just north in the Pemberton area. Some of the hottest rocks in Canada. They drilled them um, recorded temperatures of 280 degrees C. How close to the power line? Uh, it's new to Canadians, so you know we don't do these education programs often enough. So there's a lot of people when I say geothermal, think I'm going to put a heat pump under their garage. That's fine. Um, just needs more work. We have actually had some bragging rights as Borealis is that we got a geothermal permit in the Northwest Territories for another project that we're working on. That uh, there is no policy or regulatory environment regarding geothermal in the Northwest Territories. Period. I might as well have been asking for a flying monkey permit. Um, because when we told them that we were looking for a geothermal resource, they were like, what's that? Which is fine, but it means that you're, you have to add a whole other obstacle to that development list, is that I have to go get a permit to drill in an area that doesn't know what geothermal is. Um, the high front end cost we've talked about. And this is probably the biggest one, um, historically less. How you compete with dirty coal when there's no carbon pricing in place? You know, three cent coal. You just can't. Um, and historic environments, so you've already paid for the facility, you've already paid for the dam 50 years ago, it's still running. I'm competing with new energy at the price of somebody else's. I'm making a car payment when you're driving your old beaver around. Um, so you need a vision, you need a long-term vision, both from a policy perspective and from a community development perspective and for a developer. Like if Tim and I wanted to get rich, we would not be doing geothermal, apparently. Mm -hmm. um, because the timeline is just so long on the project development side. Craig, could you mention just briefly what's happening in, in Saskatchewan? Because I thought that was a yeah, that's actually example. really that's a really interesting one. There is no policy in place for well, projects moving forward across Western Canada. This is definitely one of many projects. There's about probably three or four going on in Canada right now that are moving forward. So you guys, you know, you're in a situation where you're not totally alone in terms of geothermal moving forward. There's a project actually in, in uh, southeastern Saskatchewan where they realized that the bottom of their oil wells was about 120 degrees Celsius. It's enough to produce power. By no definition in geothermal world is it a really hot resource. But they've already drilled all the holes. So I don't know if anyone's ever seen the map in southeast Saskatchewan. The Williston Basin is one of the hottest places to drill anywhere in the world right now. Um, it's part of the Bakken play that you guys hear about. So they've punched this thing where there's wellheads like every half kilometer for like 300 kilometers and it's all over the place. You can stand in the bar, stand on the roof of the bar, I know I've done this, and look out and you can see pump jack after pump jack after pump jack. They realized we have water at the bottom of this system and nobody's turning it into power. So there's a company out of, uh, deep out of Saskatchewan that's actually said, well, why don't we take what you guys consider wastewater, hook it up to a turbine and run it. And the Saskatchewan government, much to um, Tim and I were like, well, there's no policy for geothermal in Saskatchewan. But the Saskatchewan government being much more resource oriented went, ah, we'll just give it to you. We'll just let you go with it and see what you do. And then if it's great, then we'll make a policy, which is would have refreshing. Refreshing. <laughs> we, were, we did some of the technical work on the front end of the project to help mm -hmm. them, you know, understand if they could actually derive the power out of that system. Mm -hmm. And when we said, well, you're going to have to get a permit, and we made like a long, nice paragraph saying this is going to be really hard to get a permit. And they basically walked in and said, can we do this? And they went, yeah, sure, go for it. So that would be a nice change. We haven't had those same conversations in BC. Um, <laughs> So this is my uh, promo pitch here. It's sustainable, it's base load, heat flow. Uh, it is a mature industry worldwide, which I think when people run up against, they say, oh, this geothermal thing is new. You just go, listen, man, Italy, 105 years, give me a break. Um, it does have a small environmental footprint. There is long-term profitability with that upfront risk, and that's probably one of the biggest obstacles we face. 
it's clean, it's a renewable energy source, which these days, you know, when we started doing this 10 years ago was interesting. Now it's becoming primary. I would like to know how did you uh, come across Fairmont, so how, how did you know about that? This might be a good area. <coughs> yeah, you know, um, want me to handle that one? Yeah, go for it, Tim. We, we sat back and looked at DC, it must be back in 2008, and created all the front end work, and we sort of came together, I thought, and we made a list of 10 or 12 of the best prospects that we thought geologically were in DC. And he, Made that decision. I don't clue as to how we arrived at and frankly. Magic at the most. Exactly. <laughs> He's a sub service guy, right? Um, Treasure Yeah. Serial boxes, we're not sure. But nonetheless, <laughs> we submitted all those prospects to the government, all 10 or 12, whatever the number was, and said we would like to nominate them for bid. Now, the government has a process for geothermal whereby you submit these things, but it just, it just as you submit it doesn't mean it's going to be a tender. You don't know why it doesn't get tender, whether it doesn't get tender. You're done. There's no sort of discussion about it. But the only one that came back three years later, or three and a half years later, was Bill. So we went, that's on a list. Because, you know, they could have picked one that was not for this. You know what I mean? So we're like, it's on our list. It's good. That's good. Let's get in there. But uh, it's hard to say that we specifically picked, you know what I mean, Bill? We tried to see the top 10 or 12 that we sort of shoved in under the door. And it's the only one that came back up. One of the, one of the main reasons, not just geologically, but one of the reasons that for Tim and I, that the fact that Belmont came out and we were more than happy to bid on it and move the process forward is because of some of that power line issue. Mm -hmm. is that we see a lot of projects that have resource opportunity, but they're too far, too far down the line. Well, we're going to build you a line out there. When? Timeline? <coughs> yeah. So that's probably another one of the big driving factors. Well, there's the other thing that, that it's shame we're not here today. Uh, is the First Nation situation. I mean, it just as you get a geothermal permit doesn't mean you can necessarily do anything until you, uh, because the geothermal permits don't have the same pre-clearance with First Nations that an oil and gas development permit would have. So if I have one of those, I can just go ahead because it deals with the In our case, we got the permit, we spent the first 18 months trying to work out a deal with the three relevant First Nations in the area. Um, but we were, again, what made Vailman interesting from that regard is we knew that at least the Simp and the Shushwa were proactive in their attitude towards business versus some others which would just say no. Mm -hmm. Right? So you, you have to, there's many lenses you have to look at this thing through before you really get ready to go, I'm going to drop some money on this and see what goes. In the purpose of time, I'm not going to explain how we develop every project. So I'll fly through these ones really quickly and then let Tim talk about the community project. So. We explore for heat. This is probably the fourth point here. Temperature gradient can uh, dictate success. Absolutely. So how far we have to drill to get how hot? Uh, you know, the inverse relationship. It, if I can drill this thing in three meters down, I find 200 degrees C, which is some of the cases with these flash environments. Yeah, I can make power in no time and very, very cost effectively. If I have to drill seven kilometers down, I'm broke. There's no chance the project's you know, economic value tanks. So somewhere in between there is, you know, a value that we're happy to to spend in order to get the sale from BC Hydro at you know the increment cost. So that drilling program is probably one of the as many of the finance community would refer to as the riskiest part of your geothermal development. Good geologist, better finance guy. Um, we do a lot of this intro work, um, even before we went forward with the bid, you know, geologic analysis, looking at formations on a, a sort of regional level, then even some, uh, even some local um, development in terms of, you know, what kind of work we're doing on site, rock analysis. I always joke to my, uh, my little guys, or if I do school group stuff, stuff, is my job is to, I find energy rocks. That's my gig, and I build treasure maps. <laughs> so really, that is what it looks like, is that how do I drill the least amount to get the best reward? Lots of resources. Can I throw a refill in there? Yeah, always. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is, or not so funny, sometimes what will happen is you might have a target. So let's say your target's three and a half clicks down, and it's really hot, and it's great. But you're a click and a half in, you got to hit what I would excuse my language, a shitty resource, but you've got it. So the question you do sitting on the rig is, do I quit now with a crappy winner 
<laughs> or do I continue to roll dice and hope that in fact I was right about what's down there, the D. So that there's often multiple horizons. So you won't have it. It's not, not typically one target, and this yeah. gets into the complexity of geology. We want to create a path in the subsurface that will give us multiple shots at it. And the moment you sort of you have to go in and stick to your guns. If we see this at this, we quit, and we quit, even if it's better. Uh, so it's I'll take my two pair over my royal flush. You can win the hand with the small win because the trick in this game is if you blow your first well, you never get to play again. You're out. You won't get finance, but if you can win, you get to play again, and someone will give you more money. So it's a, it's a balancing act. Yeah. So we talked about the field research aspect of it. Um, we have an approach here at Borealis that's a little bit, um, I wouldn't say that conventional, is that our goal is actually spend a significantly more time and energy on the very, very, very front end, the grassroots exploration program. A lot of communities or a lot of development projects will actually try and jump as quickly as they can to a drilling program. Our goal is actually to gather as much information as we possibly can through a number of different techniques to help to sort of sort out our lemons. Uh, make sure that we have filtered as best as we possibly can for the least amount of money. So that's, I'm a big advocate, I'm a geologist anyway, but the field research uh, is probably one of the big aspects for us of getting as much done as we can. We talked about the geophysics aspects, building the model, rebuilding that model. Um, we have a, another partner, um, Dr. Yang, who is one of our uh, chief geoscientists. Um, he's a, a brilliant heat reservoir modeling guy. And so he would be actually one of the guys that would assist us in terms of understanding not only where heat is flowing, but also where the water is flowing within that heat system. So this, I joke that, yeah, rocket science, nothing to heat reservoir modeling. Um, but we have, you know, the big brain in-house, so. Um, 